good afternoon, evening, everybody. Thank you for joining today. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you. So as Paul said, my name is Dr. Sarah Howell. I'm the CEO of Aracor. I actually took over as CEO um, back in 2015. And today, hopefully, I'll give you a good overview of the company, of some of the key milestones that we've hit um, recently and our strategy moving forward. So I draw your attention to our customary legal notice momentarily. So by way of company background at Aracor, um, we're very much focused on bringing innovative new products to market that can transform patient care and quality of life. And we do this by taking existing therapeutic products that are already available and enhancing them using our innovative and proprietary formulation technology platform, Aristat. And we're very much focused on these enhancements, being able to improve that patient care and use in the wider healthcare system. And of course, as a technology platform company, intellectual property is absolutely critical to us. So we have very broad and robust IP protection, of both the Aristat technology platform itself, but also of the enhanced products that we develop using the platform. We are a clinical stage um, biopharmaceutical company. Our first area of therapeutic focus is in the diabetes space, and we have two products, both insulin-based in clinical development currently, with great phase one clinical data showing best-in-class profiles for both of those, which I'll talk about um, a little bit later. And our strategy here with our diabetes products is to take those closer to market to a higher value inflection point prior to partnering with pharma for late phase and commercialization. We've also expanded into a second um, franchise area within our internal proprietary product development that we call specialty hospital care. And it's essentially products that are currently used within the hospital setting, often to treat chronic diseases or in emergency care. But these products are only available as lyophilized powders that require a complex mixing procedure prior to use. And we're able here to use the Aristat um, technology platform to develop stable liquid ready to use versions of these products so that they can be used very quickly, safely and effectively at point of care. And to a certain extent, we validated the commercial potential within the spe specialty hospital space as we've entered into two co-development and licensing deals with Hikma Pharmaceuticals. And again, I'll talk about those a little bit later. So alongside our in-house proprietary products, which we're taking to those closer to market, higher value inflection points, we also partner with leading pharmaceutical and biotech companies. So this is where we take their products that are proprietary to them in-house, apply the Aristat technology to enhance and differentiate them. And again, they're looking for improvements for patient care, but also differentiation to help them gain market share for their proprietary products. Now, this model is revenue generating from day one. Our partners pay us to perform the formulation technology um, development programs and apply the Aristat technology. And then they have the option to um, take those novel formulations forward into further development and commercialization under a technology licensing model. And these tend to be milestone and royalty bearing. So there's significant upside potential in that model for future um, royalty bearing agreements once those products um, make it to market. So overall, really, um, here, we're a very much commercially focused business. We have existing revenue generating streams from our partnerships, best in class products in the clinic that we plan to develop to those high value inflection points. And as Paul mentioned, and as you'll know, we entered into a very successful oversubscribed AIM IPO last year, raising £20 million, and that's to support our in-house proprietary development. And I'll talk a little bit about the significant um, clinical and partner, partnering progress that we've made since then. So just moving on to the leadership team, as you would expect, we have a very experienced and um, respected leadership team in place with very broad expertise across pharmaceutical product development, commercialization and deal making, which is obviously critical to Aracor's um, strategy moving forward and our ambitious growth plans. So just moving on to the technology, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit around the technology. Obviously, it could be a session all in itself, but try and give you a flavor of what the technology is and what it can deliver. 
So first of all, if we start with what it can deliver. So here we're taking existing products that are suboptimal in some way. We apply the Aristat technology platform to develop improved and enhanced versions of these. And here are some examples. It's not an exhaustive list. So we can, for example, use the technology in some cases to modulate the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile of a drug. So this is essentially how it works and the clinical outcomes post-injection. This is very much the focus of our diabetes portfolio, so our insulin products, where we have used um, our platform to accelerate the absorption of insulin post-injection. And I'll talk about why that's so important later. We also very routinely take products that are currently stored, distributed and used often within the cold chain, and we're able to use Aristat to develop heat stable versions of these. Of course, this has been um, very topical over the last 18 months or so. We've seen the COVID vaccines being developed and bought to market, and many of those requiring quite extreme storage and use conditions like the Pfizer vaccine at minus 80. And the technology itself is indeed applicable to vaccines. We are working with a top five vaccine company at the moment doing just this, working on developing a heat stable version of one of their key products. Now, the focus of our specialty hospital care and also a number of our technology partnerships with pharma is to develop these ready to use products. So to convert these powders, which are pretty inconvenient and difficult to use into stable liquid, ready to go at the point of care products. And also we're very much seeing a trend um, towards trying to take patients out of the hospital setting. And an area that we can use the technology here is to take um, products that are currently delivered via an IV infusion within the hospital setting and develop highly concentrated stable versions of these so that they can be delivered via a single injection. And that thus gives the option to take that patient out of the hospital setting and perhaps even for self-administration at home. So that hopefully gives you a flavour of some of the benefits that we can bring to the table here. And then if we look at the technology platform itself and how does it work? So we're taking this suboptimal product, applying Aristat and developing an enhanced version of that product. And when we start working on a product, we always start in the same way. The first thing that we'll do is to define what is the target product profile. So essentially, what is the enhancement of properties that we're looking to achieve? And once we've defined that target product profile, we'll then use our internal know-how and expertise to understand the challenges that we need to overcome and what's preventing those enhancements of properties being achieved today. And once we've identified those challenges, we can effectively choose tools from within our Aristat um, technology platform. And each of these tools is essentially a very specific combination of excipients or ingredients that when we combine them together with a product will enhance a specific property. Now we're working on very complex products and molecules here and many biologicals, for example. So there's always more than one challenge that we need to overcome. So we'll select the tools from our platform to overcome each challenge. So we might select tool, for example, one, three and five. And then we combine these together in our lab set to our core to determine whether we're broadly in the right design space. And what this means is, are we seeing broadly the enhancement of properties that we would expect to see from the use of these um, Aristat tools. And once we know we're in the right design space, this is where our proprietary algorithm comes in. And what our algorithm allows us to do is then select the exact ratios of all of these ingredients or excipients, so we're blending them together to develop the optimal formulation of the product that gives us the optimal enhancement of properties. And using this um, platform, which is very transferable and scalable, we're able to routinely deliver enhanced versions of products which are otherwise unachievable. So I'm just going to move on to talk a little bit about our portfolio. So what we are looking at here is a combination of the Aracor internal proprietary products in dark blue and our partner programs in orange. So perhaps if I start with our internal proprietary products in the blue here, what's important to note here is that we're taking existing products that are already on the market and already used by patients such as insulin and applying the Aristat technology platform to enhance them. 
And the reason this is important is because it means that the safety and effectiveness or efficacy of these products is already known, which means we can follow abbreviated regulatory and development pathways to market. So that means we can bring these genuinely enhanced products that improve patient outcomes and quality life to market at a lower cost, faster, and at a lower risk compared to a traditional biotech um, model here. And as you can see for our lead diabetes products, AT247 and AT278, these are currently within clinical development. And these clinical studies are essentially to demonstrate the benefits that they bring to patients. And then we'll be looking to um, take market share within that $6.4 billion existing market for these types of insulin. And then perhaps if we move on to our partner programs and, and perhaps firstly on our specialty hospital products. So if we look at AT282, which is the first of our co-development and licensing um, agreements with HICMA, this product started its life um, in Aracor Research. So it was an internal proprietary product. And we'd identified a product which was in an existing $600 million plus market where all versions of this product were a lyophilized powder that required this complex reconstitution. And this is used within the hospital setting. So we use the Arasat technology to develop a stable liquid version, ready to use version of this product. And at this stage um, entered into a partnership with HICMA and HICMA will take on responsibility for further development and commercialization of this product. And this has the real potential to be the first and perhaps only ready to use product within this competitive market segment and the opportunity there for HICMA as our partner to gain market share in this market segment. And this is a milestone and royalty bearing agreement to Aracor. And to give you a sense of, of value there, if HICMA were to take approximately 20% market share of that existing market, then we'd be looking at um, sort of double digit teams, millions of recurring royalty to Aracor annually. And then um, the second program with HICMA 8307 um, is a similar structure of co-development and licensing agreement there targeting an existing $300 million market. And perhaps just to um, demonstrate and talk about one of our technology partnership structures. So this is where the product is owned by um, a pharma partner and they come to us looking for an enhancement. So if you look at AT220, um, unfortunately at this stage, I can't tell you the product or the um, partner um, currently. Hopefully in the, in the future, we'll be able to disclose that. But what I can tell you is here that we've used the Aristat technology to enhance this product the Aristat technology is now incorporated within that product, which is in late stage um, development. And we'd expect that to be on market um, from 2023 onwards, providing our partner is successful there in the regulatory approvals and launch. And that's in a multi-billion dollar, it's a $2 billion plus um, target market there that they'll be looking to gain market share and that market share hopefully to be improved by the enhancements that um, the Aristat technology has brought to the table. And again, to give you some sense of the value there, um, if they were looking at a 20% market share, you'd be looking at low single digit millions of um, recurring royalty to Aracor if our partner's successful. And then at the bottom here, you can see we have multiple pre-license um, formulation development studies. So these are in-house, our partner's products, but we're working on them in-house at Aracor at the moment. And we entered into five of these new partnerships in 2021. Three of the companies you can see named here and two are undisclosed. So we're very much a commercially focused business. We do partner with pharma and we do do deals with pharma, which I think is important. And these deals really do also validate the strength and the need for the Aristat technology. So I'm now going to talk a little bit more about our proprietary um, diabetes products that are in the clinic currently. So I think we probably all know that diabetes has reached a pandemic levels worldwide. Um, it's now estimated that there's around 537 million people living with diabetes. And despite significant advancements in treatment options and care, it's still considered that only 6%, that's a, a single digit 6% of people with diabetes are under good control. And when we talk about um, good control here, it's all around maintaining good um, blood glucose control. 
So if we look at the diagram in the middle here, I'll try and explain um, this in a little bit more detail. So for a person living with diabetes, their daily challenge is to try and control their blood glucose inside a healthy target range, which is shown in the light purple here. And they can manage this through most of the day and night, but the challenge for them comes around meal times. And um, because when we eat a meal, our blood glucose rises very rapidly. And the fact is that the current gold standard insulin treatments that are available on the market today are still not fast enough acting to counteract that very swift rise in blood glucose and bring um, the patients back into that healthy target range quickly enough. And as a result of this, a person with diabetes tends to spend around 25% of their time with their blood glucose too high, so in hyperglycemia, and about 5% of their time with their blood glucose too low in hypoglycemia. And it's this time spent out of range that leads to very serious disease complications associated with diabetes. So, for example, there's a 200% increase in all-cause morbidity, and 70% of people with diabetes die from cardiovascular disease. And this is a direct result of having their blood glucose outside of this healthy target range. So at Aracor, in our first product, AT247, what we're targeting here is to use the technology to develop a, the fastest acting insulin that's available to patients, which will help them better control their blood glucose, particularly around meal times. And we've done this using a novel formulation of an existing insulin that's on the market today. I should also note, obviously, as we're using a proprietary technology approach here, that we expect to have patent protection out for both AT247 and 278, which I'll talk about in a moment, until at least 2037. So I'm just going to talk a little bit around the um, clinical data that we have for AT247. So here we were looking at comparing AT247 with two of the gold standard insulins on the market today. Nova Rapid, which is a rapid acting insulin, and FIAS, which is an ultra rapid acting insulin from Nova Nordis. And what we were looking to demonstrate was a faster acting profile for AT247. So this study was in phase, uh, a phase one study in type one diabetic patients. So it's in the patient population. We're able to skip the healthy volunteer stage because um, insulin is well known and characterized. So what you're looking at here um, is our pharmacokinetic um, data. So we have 8247 in the green. And I'll just talk about it in relation to FIAS because it's the fastest acting comparator in this study is in the blue. So the pharmacokinetic data is essentially the levels of insulin in the blood post a single injection at time zero given to a type one diabetic patient. And the first thing you can see um, with 8247 is this shift to the left. So what this means is, is that we saw an acceleration of the absorption of insulin. Um, so we saw a faster appearance of insulin than in the blood compared with FIAS. And importantly, we saw a twofold increase in AT247 in the first 30 minutes and a one and a half times fold. So one and a half times more um, AT247 in the blood compared to FIASP in the first 60 minutes. And I'm talking about this first hour because this, this is time where we've eaten food, our blood glucose has risen very rapidly. And we need that insulin on board to start bringing our blood glucose back into a healthy range. So we knew we'd accelerated the absorption here and we were getting more insulin on board. But the important factor is, is it having an impact on glucose lowering? So um, what I'm showing you now is the pharmacodynamic data. So this is effectively the glucose lowering effect. And what we can see here again, looking at 247 in the green versus FIASP in the blue, is that we saw a threefold increase in glucose lowering in the first 30 minutes. So three times more glucose lowering compared to FIASP in the first 30 minutes and a twofold um, increase in the first 60 minutes. So um, this data really did demonstrate to us that we have the potential for AT247 to be the best in class, fastest acting insulin, and indeed significantly and statistically faster than FIAS, which is um, the fastest insulin on the market um, today. So um, we've currently entered into a second clinical study for AT247, which is studying um, this drug in, in 
for patients, type one patients using insulin pump therapy. And we're performing this study in the US. This is an important study because we see the most benefit for 247 to be for type one um, diabetic patients and particularly those using insulin pumps. So these are patients that are looking for very tight and precise control of their blood glucose and hence looking for faster acting insulins. So I'm just going to move on to talk about our second um, insulin-based product. So again, we take an existing insulin that's already on the market, but in this case, for AT278, we've developed a highly concentrated, rapid-acting version of this product. So I'm going to talk a little bit of this background here in terms of what the challenges associated um, with this and what the patient um, need is to try and put this into context. So in terms of the challenge, um, it's well known that when you increase the concentration of insulin, it slows down its time action profile. So essentially, it makes it a slower acting insulin. And as we've just spoken about, we need faster acting insulins for better blood glucose control, particularly around meal times. So what we were looking to achieve with 8278 is to develop this very highly concentrated um, insulin, but it's also rapid acting. And the need here is, is really twofold. So there is a growing number of patients that um, require high daily units of insulin, so high daily doses of insulin every day. And this is particularly for type 2 diabetic patients and for obese type 2 um, diabetic patients. And for these individuals, there's two options available to them at the moment. They can either use the only concentrated insulin available on the market. This is at 500 units per mil, which is the same concentration as our AT278. And um, the issue with this insulin is that it is slow acting because it's highly concentrated. You see this kind of intermediate slow acting insulin. So there's a compromise there on blood glucose control. And um, despite this, many patients still do um, select this product. It's a product from Eli Lilly called Humulin RU500. And the reason they select it is because that they can deliver their very high daily doses in a reduced injection volume and also by fewer injections a day. And they accept that compromise on blood glucose control and then ultimately outcomes. Or they can choose one of the rapid acting insulins that are on the market from Nova Nordis or Eli Lilly. So we've got Nova Rapid and Humalog. And these are at 100 units per mil, so a five fold decrease um, in concentration here. So they'll um, gain the benefit of um, better blood glucose controls as these are fast acting insulins. However, they'll need to deliver their very high daily doses via um, increased injection volumes and by more injections a day. So with AT278 being a rapid acting and concentrated insulin, they can have the best of both worlds essentially. Um, and delivering their high daily units by um, lower injection volume and fewer injections a day, but not compromising on their blood glucose control and outcomes. So we're very much targeting this existing patient population. We see it as a product, particularly for type 2 um, diabetes and um, an improvement in the standard of care for them currently. We also see potential for 278 to be a market disruptor. Um, we see a trend towards the use of insulin pumps um, through better control and more convenient and compliant um, for patients. However, for these high insulin users and type 2 diabetics, a barrier to entry here is the size of the pumps because of the, the amount of insulin they need to have on board there or the complexity of managing the pump because they need to keep changing out um, their insulin here. So there's a real potential here for 8278 to be able to enable that next generation of miniaturized pumps. So very small insulin patch pumps that the patient can wear and really move more of this very underpenetrated type two market through to insulin pump therapy. In fact, of the 54 million um, estimated insulin users worldwide currently, and 38 million of those are type 2 diabetics. So it's a significant um, market growth potential here. So I'll just talk a little bit about the clinical data. We've only released our headline um, results at this stage, and we'll be presenting our full um, results at a diabetes conference um, next month, actually. So we'll be able to talk in a little bit more detail about these um, next time. 
So here we were comparing 80278, which is a 500 units per mil insulin to Nova Rapid, which is Novo's rapid acting insulin at 100 units per mil. So it's five times more concentrated, essentially 80278. Again, this was a study in type 1 diabetic patients. We can skip that healthy volunteer stage. And we were looking here essentially to match the kinetics of um, Nova Rapid. We wanted it to be at least as fast acting and a similar glucose lowering profile to Nova Rapid, despite that fivefold increase in concentration. And the study itself met all of its primary and secondary endpoints including that non-inferiority compared to Nova Rapid, but it also exceeded our expectations by demonstrating a significantly accelerated early PKPD profile. So we saw the shift to the left there, so a more rapid acting and greater glucose lowering profile in that early part of the time curve after you've eaten a meal. So here we see, you know, really significant potential here for 8278 to be the first and perhaps only concentrated rapid acting insulin available to patients and that opportunity to um, penetrate that really underpenetrated type 2 um, diabetic market um, currently. So in terms of next steps, I think, as I mentioned, we've entered into our next clinical study for 8247. It's in the US using insulin pumps. This is important because the US is very important um, patient and market segment for this product. They have the highest number of insulin pump users and the highest proportion of insulin sales across that 6.4 um, billion dollar market currently and we anticipate to have our full results from this study in the second half of this year and then for 8278 on the back of our better and expected um, clinical um, results we're um, finalizing our um, clinical design for that next clinical study and we expect to start dosing that again in the second half of this year and as I mentioned releasing our full clinical results um, next month and the diabetes conference. So um, just moving on briefly to our financial highlights, as I mentioned, we had a successful AIM IPO back in June uh, last year. We raised £20 million at a share price of £2.26. So at that time, it was a market cap of £62.5 um, million on admission. Um, the um, share price and, and has performed well since that time, despite some pretty difficult uh, market conditions. And as our year ending 31st of December, we'll be um, releasing our full results at the week commencing the 25th of April. But our financial performance is in line with expectations. And we ended the financial year with a strong cash position of 18.3 um, million. So just to round off, really, I mean, we certainly um, gained significant momentum in 2021, hitting a number of um, key milestones. You can see here both clinical um, with our 8278 um, better than expected clinical results, um, IND allowance and subsequent dosing for 8247. We entered into five new technology partnerships, which have that significant upside potential from licensing, um, which we'd expect to be milestone and royalty bearing from um, pharma. I haven't mentioned, but we also um, earlier last year were awarded a 2.8 million pounds Innovate UK grant to support the phase two clinical development of 8247. And then looking forward into this year, um, we'll be um, looking forward to our clinical results from that insulin pump study for 8247 in the second half of the year, initiating the next clinical study for um, 8278. Also under our co-development and licensing partnership with HICMA, we'd expect to achieve the next licensing milestone, really taking that closer um, to market and that significant upside potential there. And we'd expect as well to see continuing technology partnering growth. It's not within the, the time period of this year, but just a, a reminder as well that we'd expect the first product that incorporates the Aristat technology to be on the market from 2023 onwards. And that's where we start to see that recurring um, roy royalty build um, should our partners be successful there. So um, that's the end of the, the presentation today, but I'd be more than happy to take any questions that anybody has.
let me start my video. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was uh, that was especially fascinating for me because I, I knew nothing about the company in advance, and it was uh, it's always great to hear about uh, you know British companies that have such you know groundbreaking uh, technology. Um, I guess one of the questions that that occurred to me, and one of the perks of my job is I get to ask my questions first, is when you have um, these uh, deals with companies like like Hikma, um, if they're successful and it goes into production, do you have any further role really to play? You you don't need to produce any of the items at that stage. It, it, it's it's just a royalty payment effectively to you. Is it at that point? Yeah, so for um, those programs that are either licensed to partners or, you know, it's their proprietary product and they come to us, we perform in-house that formulation um, development work applying the Aristat technology, but then essentially under license, it's handed back to our partners. So you're right, they're responsible then for um, further development and commercialization and the costs therein of the product. So it's, it's uh, you know, 100% margin that stage for, for Aracor. Fantastic. And, and again, excuse me, I might bore people that already know all this, but when you when you came to AIM, typically people come with, you know, cornerstone investors and institutional support, etc. Could you say a few words about who those people are, who your big backers are? Yeah, sure. So, you know, coming into the IPO, we had institutional investors such as Unilever, um downing albion calculus and and of those um da and bgf and of those um albion and uh, sorry bgf and downing and calculus all followed their investments as well and um, now we have bgf as our um, single largest shareholder within the company currently but they've been joined and um, we can see this as, as well of course on our website they've been um, joined by other institutional investors as well such as Chelton, Amati, Unicorn etc. No, oh, good well, that's that's um, a good list of names um, and I guess one other question which I always always ask companies and sometimes you can say sometimes you can't um, but having only recently come to AIM you know you've you've got sufficient cash for the foreseeable future presumably yeah, I mean, and as you'll see when we release our um, results the week commencing 25th, that will come with the, the usual statements about um, sort of cash runway and certainly in terms of going concern, a cash runway of greater than 12 months for our current plans. And, and you know, that 20 million was really to take our proprietary products, particularly the diabetes products, to that value inflection point and partnering value inflection point. Fantastic. Well, now we can go on to the our audience's questions, which are much more intelligent than mine. Um, so uh, we've got uh, obviously a few of them are keen investors that uh, that know a lot about the company. And uh, the, the most popular question here is, as you progress your insulin based in-house projects to completion and hopefully out licensing, what projects are on the gosh, this guy's eager, I tell you, what projects are on the top of your shortlist of new potential in-house projects to replenish the in-house development pipeline? Uh, and in particular, would you consider reviving the glucagon, glucagon project for diabetics that you were working on five or six years ago? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of the pipeline, we've obviously, alongside the two diabetes products I talked about in more detail today, we have additional um, products within the diabetes space, which are co-formulation products. They're earlier in development, certainly more complex in development, but again, significant um, potential there to bring benefits to patients and, and market potential. And then for the specialty hospital programs, we've partnered two of those to Hikma Pharmaceuticals already, but we have a portfolio of similar products that all meet that specification, if you like, that there's a there's significant market potential plus a need for ready to use liquid products where all others are currently lyophilized that require this re reconstitution. So and, you know, internally within our kind of portfolio review part, of that is product selection. So, um, you know, we have an ongoing stream of new earlier research programs that we're 
bringing into in-house development that as we develop those and um, increase our partnering potential moving forward to take those to market so that there is a a healthy pipeline of products coming through development in-house and then glucagon yes so yeah, quite a while ago, um, we were developing a liquid glucagon. So glucagon, you know, fits this brief as a it's an emergency treatment for people with diabetes that are having a severe hypoglycemia, so very, very low blood sugar, and they can't rescue themselves. And it was a LIO product that needed this complex reconstitution, so it would meet that brief. Um, we decided to put glucagon on hold because we felt that we um, had missed the commercial window for that. So we stopped that quite early in research development because at that time there were a, a, a number of companies uh, further ahead. One of those being a company called Xeris, who's launched a liquid glucagon now. And another Zealand farmer, a sort of mid-sized farmer company that were developing a novel analog of glucagon, glucagon, sorry, that have approval now. So, um, so we halted that program for commercial reasons. I think those reasons are, are still valid. That's a pretty crowded market now. Very comprehensive. I think that this is a key question, um, which is. Uh, you know, who are your competitors in this space? Are there are there other companies using other technologies to achieve similar formulation improvements, or are the only real competitors the in-house formulation groups within big pharma companies? Yeah, I'll probably split this into two. So, um, if we talk about um, sort of diabetes, there then. Um, we, we do have a competitor in this space that's using a formulation technology as well, looking at developing more rapid acting insulins, um, Adosia, the French biotech um, company there. Um, what I would say is that, you know, we've compared our insulin 80247 against FIASP and shown superiority um, there. So we haven't compared against Adosia's product um but certainly our improvement over fias is greater than than the head-to-head -head for adosia's program there so we're confident in this position of the potential to have the best in class fastest acting insulin but of course we keep an eye on all of those um developments and external factors that could affect commercialization of the product and then in terms of just generally formulation technology um, there, I think the person that asked the question is right, that our main competitor is that, in fact, our partners um, in terms of the large pharma companies. So we need to ensure there that we remain innovative, that we invest in R&D ourselves internally to ensure that our technology can still continue to meet our USP, which is enhancing products and, and bringing superior products to market that are otherwise unachievable, because that's really the core of the company. Um, very good. Then uh, would you need to partner the insulins before phase two or can you complete phase two with funds you already have? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So the 20 million supports the phase two um, clinical development of those products and also, of course, we'll be leveraging the £2.8 million pounds we were awarded from Innovate UK as well to support phase two um, clinical development. And the reason it, it does support it, you might wonder the £20 million pounds doesn't seem that much for phase two, is because it's insulin and the safety and effectiveness is known. It means that also the clinical studies are quite lean. We can run these clinical studies with fairly small patient numbers because what we're looking to demonstrate here is not the safety that's known, it's the clinical benefit. So we're looking at um, proving and demonstrating the differentiation of the products. And you can do that with relatively small patient numbers. As you can see from our phase one studies, one was 19 patients and the second was 38 patients. And so does that, does that also, um, is that something that uh, affects the length of time of the study as well? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, our first clinical study, we were looking at it was a time frame of around six months from start to finish. Yeah, good. Um, 
So can you talk about how significant the market is in the area of biosimilars? There are multiple tens of billions of dollars of biological products coming off patent in the next five to 10 years. And is that an opportunity? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's a, a huge market, actually. And as you said, you, you know, there is a constant stream of um, blockbuster products, um, you know, greater than billion dollar sales. There's some significantly more than billion dollar sales that's coming off patent. And, and actually our, our partner program, which is the first that we'd expect to come to market in 2023 is a biosimilar product there. So our partner was looking for an enhancement of that product because it's a very competitive space. There are always a number of um, biosimilar players looking to take market share in these large market segments. So it, it really is a, it's a great opportunity for Aaron Core because we can use our technology to deliver improvements but um, that can still be developed by the biosimilars regulatory pathway. So you, you don't increase the developmental regulatory burden that can um, bring market differentiation to these products. So it, it's certainly a, a core target area for us. Uh, and, when, and when you do that, does that um, open up the patent window opportunity for the, uh, for the original product? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's two there's two elements to that. The first is that um, you know you need to be able to provide your partner with freedom to operate, so to work around existing patents that exist for that product, which is always extensive, and and we can use the technology to do that because we have unique approaches to formulation. And then also you can further protect, you know, the new formulation with the enhancements that you develop for a partner will come with what we call foreground IP. So essentially IP covering the novel formulation from the Aristat technology plus the product, which of course gives it a, a protection in the marketplace. So it can't simply be copied by a competitor. Um, are all your excipients generally accepted as safe? Yes. Um, that's the short answer. There are, of course, some always some nuances around there. So, yes, we generally use um, grass excipients. So um, that are approved for the route of administration. In some special cases, such as our insulin products there, we've used a novel excipient that was needed to gain that superior acceleration of um, action there. But we have um, performed all the relevant and um, toxicology studies, and they've been approved by both the European and the US FDA regulators. So we're confident there on that development pathway moving forward. Okay, and then there's always, there's always a question like this, which I think, oh, will you be able to answer this? But I'm gonna throw it out there anyway. I'll just are, say there, no. are there only three realistic partners for your insulins being Sanofi, Lilly and Novo? Uh, yeah, again, I think the simple answer to that is no, they're the obvious partners and, you know, of course, they're major um, pharma in the diabetes space who are currently dominating the insulin market. So, you know, what I would say is that we have close relationships with those companies, you might have noticed on the earlier side, one of our technology partnerships is with Eli Lilly, we've had, had a long standing relationship with them so we know them well so our clinical study designs have been designed to demonstrate the benefit of our insulin products but also to generate the data that we know um, these partners would be looking for for them to make a decision on whether to take that forward into further development and commercialization so you know that's very much with input from pharma but, you know, in addition to the, the major companies, there's also the biosimilar companies now looking to gain market share within the insulin space. It's a large target market, of course, 6.4 billion. So there's significant interest there. And these companies are now building um, sales and marketing infrastructure in the major markets, including the US, that so have the potential to launch a product such as AT247 or AT278. So I think there are additional pharma options. And then the other side of that is the device companies. We're seeing, you know, much more um, interest and uptake of insulin delivery devices, whether it be pens or um, pumps, for example. So, you know, as we're looking at disrupting the market with AT278, for example, 
in a miniaturized pump, then I think that opens up different types of partners and partnerships to um, take these products to market. Very comprehensive answer. Um, could you explain why a high concentrated solution of insulin is slower acting than a low concentrated solution? Is it just a viscosity effect or are there other factors involved? Yeah, it's generally a physical effect here that, you know, you're looking to try and um, you're injecting a large, um, you know, volume concentration of insulin into subcutaneous space. And that's got to be um, released effectively for use. So it's a it's a physical um, chemistry issue, really, which was partly why it's uh, it was um, ideal for the, the Aristat technology. Very good. I, th I think I'm not sure whether we've uh, uh, been asked this one already, but I I'm a bear of very little brain, so I'll ask it again. Are you intending to partner the insulins before or after phase two? You know, we are, our plans are to, um, you know, take them to higher value inflection points to, to take them closer to market. So we're planning on and we raise the funds to perform phase two clinical development because we feel that that will generate the data that we're confident in from our phase one clinical studies that really adds the value to those products. So that was really the, the main reason for going for the, um, you know, the IPO last year and raising that 20 million pounds so that we had the capital to be able to do that and didn't need to enter into a, an early uh, lower value deal. Yeah, negotiate from a position of strength. Yeah. Uh, is it likely that the diabetes products will still be best in class by the time they reach the market? And this viewer has noticed that FIASP was approved in 2017 and he's wondering whether there might be a successor product in development at the moment. Um, I mean, it, it's difficult to, to say for sure in terms of, you know, what's in development in sort of large pharma companies, but certainly from data that's in the public domain, there, there isn't any clinical data that we've seen that would demonstrate a, a profile that's significantly faster um, in a head-to-head -head versus FIASP, which is an ultra-rapid acting insulin, or the Umjev from Lilly, which is an ultra-rapid acting insulin. So at the moment, we're confident in that best-in-class position. And, and what's within our cause control is the speed at which we now develop the product and bring it to market. Yeah. And have you got any ambitions in glucose-sensitive insulin, which are being developed, I understand, by both Novo and Lilly? Yeah, I mean, I think the glucose sensitive insulin is a is interesting space, very tricky problem to solve there. And I think, you know, for Aracor, you know, we look at um, products and modalities within the diabetes space, obviously of interest to us to look for if there's a fit with the Aristat technology. So in any areas that we would see a fit, then we would look to explore those in more detail. Okay. Um, is there any data on the approval rate from phase one to approval or from preclinical to approval for reformulations? It would seem that the chances of approval should be vastly higher. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, here, most drugs fail in development for safety or efficacy here. And of course, both of those are already proven for insulin. We're not changing the insulin or modulating the insulin itself in any way it's its environment essentially that we're changing there so really that the main risk for Aracor is a commercial risk about bringing the products to market and finding the right partner to bring a, a very large product like insulin to market rather than a technical um, risk here the, the biggest risk was going into the phase one clinical study was it actually fast we wouldn't expect now those um, pharmacokinetics or dynamics to change in any of our clinical studies moving forward. Okay, and then we've got a couple of final questions which are on a slightly different, different issue. First of all, there's one which I think you sort of half answered, but are there going to be any additional fundraisings in the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, we obviously, we raised the, the 20 million to take us to that partnering value inflection point for those 
for our diabetes products and we have our portfolio of early phase products as well that we're moving through development so you know we wouldn't really comment on next equity raise or, or fundraises and it would really depend there on opportunities to really um, add value to the company and return um, value to our shareholders okay and and this one's always a bit tricky for companies to answer but i, I think it, it is kind of relevant to to your company Company, which is whether you have any plans to improve the liquidity of the shares. I, I know that they're obviously um, quite tightly held, and that can that can mean that the, the buy sell spread is is a bit large. Which for new investors, um, which to be honest, I'm quite keen on 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 everything you've said today, can can be a, can be a little bit problematic. Um, is is that something that's on your on your radar? Yeah, it's probably not one for me to answer. Actually, I'd. I'd probably advise the person that asks the question perhaps have a chat with Pam Yours, who are our nomad and broker about the liquidity. Yes, no, it, it's it's a problem with a lot of a lot of companies mm. that if they're if they're good, people don't want to sell the shares. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then you just end up in this sort of Mexican situation. Yeah. Uh so uh there's just one last question that's just just come in. Do you expect that your biosimilar partner will be reaching the market shortly after patent protection expires? So, you know, obviously for them, they'll, um, they'll be taking the product to market once the originator um, sort of active ingredient pattern expires because they won't be able to launch prior to that. But what they will as well bring to the market is additional pattern protection for their enhanced product and enhanced formulation from the, um, from the Aristat technology platform as well, but they'll certainly have freedom to operate when they take it to market. Fantastic. Well, that you've gone through all the questions pretty much to the minute on time. So that's uh, that's very good. Hopefully everyone's everyone's found out what they needed to find out. And uh, that was a fascinating, fascinating introduction to the company. So thank you very much for spending your time telling us about it. Great, thank you for joining. <laughs>